you know, what is the consequence of poor bone health? What is the consequence of low bone density? I think, you know, some people are who will be listening to this will have already known issues of bone density, and some people have never thought about this before in their life. And so, you know, what would you say to those people on why they should care about this and why they should think about it? This is one of those things that I would say five years ago, I was not paying nearly as much attention to as I am today. Um, and I, I think the easiest way to show this is, um, I, I put a, a couple figures together. So can you pull up figure one, Nick? Okay, so this is a figure that we made. It's an internal analysis, but it's it's a very straightforward analysis. All we've done is taken data from the uh, CDC database from 2019. The reason we use 2019 is by the time you get to 2020, you start to get some COVID data mixed in there. Um, although the accidental stuff only changes in that you see a higher rate of overdose. So you're looking at the absolute number of deaths by decade for people age 25 to 35, all the way up to 85 and up. And we basically break accidental deaths into four categories. So overdoses, transportation accidents, which are mostly car accidents, falls, and everything else. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, those first three, accidental overdose, transport deaths, and falls represent virtually all accidental deaths. So you can almost ignore everything else. This is the absolute numbers. These are total numbers. And I think kind of two things stand out here um, really clearly. The first is that for people, you know, younger than 60, uh, overdoses are the predominant cause of accidental death. And for people over 65, falling is. But if you go to the next figure, it tells, I think, a more important story, which is when you adjust for the population, because remember, in figure one, what I'm showing you is total number of deaths. But what you don't realize is that you, as you move left to right, the denominator, the population is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. There are fewer and fewer people in each bucket as you go to the right. So to correct for that, we would ask the question, which is how many of these deaths per 100,000 people occur in each group? And if you look at that figure, I think the story is readily apparent, which is that by the time you're 75, the risk of death from a fall is enormous. Now, it's not as high as Alzheimer's disease, it's not as high as cancer, and it's not as high as heart disease, but it comes in pretty much just after that. So this is what sets the stage, because on the one hand, I think you can look at these data and say, wow, this is really problematic. But the other point is you can't wait until you're in that bucket to decide you're going to do something about it. So just as for atherosclerosis, we don't want to wait until we've had our first heart attack to say, oh, well, and I really, I really need to worry about my ApoB and maybe I should stop smoking and make sure my blood pressure is okay. You don't want to wait until you have osteopenia or osteoporosis and you're 60 years old to say, it's time to do something about this. Now, if you're there, there's lots to do about it. But it's just as important if you're 25 years old. And frankly, it's just as important as a parent if you're thinking about what your 5-year-old and 10-year-old and 15-year-old should be doing to make sure that they're setting themselves up for the best outcomes possible as they age, of course. Okay, so Nick, let's let's look at figure three now. because So what you're looking at here is the uh, excess mortality for women, which is shown on the top, men, which is shown on the bottom, following a hip fracture. And this is gonna come up over and over again. We're gonna get into some data about what are the fractures that really end lives. And you're gonna see it's primarily hip fractures. Uh, a pelvic fracture, I would think is probably second. Um, and again, in part, this results from the immobility that comes after it. Um, but. I think there are some other reasons at play there. But so what we're looking at here in the top graph is women following a hip fracture, men following a hip fracture, and you're looking at mortality as a function of age. Now, this is kind of staggering. I mean, when I first saw this, I couldn't believe it. Um, and I apologize for people who are only listening to this podcast. Um, Again, this is one of those podcasts where I think it really helps to be able to see the figures. I'll do my best to kind of explain what the figures show. But for those who are looking at it, I don't think you need me to say anything. So you can just plug your ears and go la 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 as I explain this because there's nothing I need to say if you can read this graph. 
So if you're 90 years old or above and you're a man and you have a hip fracture in this data set, and we're going to talk about other data sets in a moment. 40%, actually more than 40% of you will be dead within a year. Now that mortality comes down. That's generally the case. The mortality tends to come down because there's kind of a survival benefit or there's fewer people in that group, right? So, you know, what's the mortality of people who are 90 over the next 10 years? That number's going down because most of them have already died. You can see for the younger demographics, the numbers go up. So, you know, the good news is in this cohort, at least if you're 70 years old and you break your hip, you know, 10% of those people are going to be dead in three years, but that number just keeps going up and up and up. So I think that the, the important thing here from this data set, because we're going to look at another one in a second, that I think is more stark in this data set. What you realize is that for older people, people over the age of 85, people over the age of 80, which I would argue is not really that old. I mean, I think most of us you know, listening to this podcast, if we're not that age, certainly have aspirations to be that age, your mortality is, you know, in the neighborhood of a third within a year after a hip fracture. So, you know, um, Nick, we're going to have Michael Easter on the podcast coming up soon, aren't we? Like, I think we're having, um, we're having Michael, I mean, I know we do the interview next month, so that'll, that'll, that should come out soon, right? Yeah, that will come out, uh, midsummer probably. Yeah. So, so for those who aren't familiar with Michael's work, he wrote a book called The Comfort Crisis, which I'm going to say is probably, you know, one of the 10 books that I'll sort of force down most people's throats if given the chance. Um, I think it's a really important book. And um, it'll a topic from that book will actually come up later in this episode, Nick, when we start to talk about exercise and what we can do to um, reduce the loss of bone mineral density as we age. But in the book, he makes some references to a few studies that I went back and looked at that talk about um, some of the unbelievable high mortalities in other fractions. So, so if you look at another study, the study had like about 200 people in it. Um, it looked at the six month mortality in people who were 65 or older who fractured their hip. And the mortality was 25%. Again, I want to repeat what the implication of that is. So if you look at a group of people who are 65 years old or older, who fracture their hip falling, 25% of those people will be dead in six months. Now, obviously when you include younger people, that mortality goes way down. So if they lowered the threshold in that study to people 50 and older, that mortality came down to just under 14%. Another study, which was a Finnish study that looked at a little over 400 consecutive hip fractures in patients found that the one year post-operative mortality was just over 27%. So again, totally different patient population, but identified, and by the way, different country, very similar trend. And I think perhaps the most rigorous of these studies was a large study that looked at about 122,000 participants who were at least 60 years old from various cohorts. So Europe, the U S et cetera, followed them for 12 or 13 years on average. And during that time found 4,200, uh, hip fractures. This study was able to then compare total mortality and look at the hazard ratio in the first year following the hip fracture. So now this is asking the question, what is the probability or what is the increased risk of death one year following the hip fracture in this patient population? Again, these are people enrolled at the age of 60 or beyond. And the hazard ratio is 2.78. So again, what does that mean? 2.78 means a 178% increase in the risk of mortality within one year following a hip fracture. There are lots of studies like this. I don't think we need to spend the rest of the AMA on it. I think regardless of how you slice and dice these data, a hip fracture is a devastating outcome. And it's something that we really want to avoid um, at any age, but especially when we're into our seventh decade and beyond. 
Uh, just for reference, what's the hazard ratio for smoking again? The hazard ratio for smoking on all cause mortality is less than 2.78 for sure because the hazard ratio for end stage renal disease is about 2.76 for all cause mortality. Smoking is probably just below two. So great, great point, Nick. This has a greater mortality than smoking. Yeah, the other really interesting thing when you look at that, those two graphs is I would love to do a study on the people who are over 90 when they fractured their hip and survived at 10 years, you know, who are those people in their hundreds, just like kicking it around, still going strong. It'd be, re be really interesting to see. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights. You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future. Thank <laughs> you.